I'm Ricky O'Patterney from the at Google team, and this is Michael Kinsley. It's a great pleasure to have him with us today. Uh, Michael, as many of you know, previously worked at Microsoft, where he founded the online magazine Slate.com. Um, prior to that, he was the liberal host on CNN's Crossfire. He served as editor at The New Republic and Harper's, The Economist's American editor, and the opinion page editor at the LA Times. Um, his writing has appeared pretty much everywhere that's anywhere, The Washington Post, The New York Times, The New Yorker, The Wall Street Journal, The Times of London, among others. And he's produced some of the funniest, most intelligent, incisive, and contrarian work in American journalism. Um, several of his columns are written since 1995 are collected in his new book, Please Don't Remain Calm, which hopefully most of you now have in your hands. Um, Michael and I are going to be discussing his work for a bit, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. If you do have a question, um, please make your way over to the microphone on the left side of the room in the aisle. And with those instructions, please join me in welcoming Michael Kinsley to Google. Thanks. And, and I, I want to collect those adjectives, <laughs> incisive and the rest. That, the, that was good. Thank another you. another blurb for you. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to start off by, by talking about what, what's kind of the elephant in the room here, um, which you know, is not the Republican Party, as George Lakoff might say. But you've had Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. for, for 15 years. Now, and there's a collection in this piece. Um, I you mean there's a piece in this collection? Sorry, there's a piece in the collection, mm -hmm. which I believe you titled In Defense of Denial. And, and you essentially lay out these responses that, that people have to diseases like this, one of them being to sort of trumpet their victimhood and, and fight against the disease, and the other being to, to deny it and hide it, which, which you did for a number of years. Um, what prompted you to, to go public with your having the disease? I assume part of it was the fact that you could no longer hide it, that the symptoms yeah, yeah. had gotten. It, Parkinson's is incurable at the moment, and it's progressive. But it moves very slowly in most cases. So you know, every year it was a little worse. And every year I sort of had told one or two people and that started to add up, and, and I had this feeling that a lot of people knew. Um, and so eventually, you know, it's sort of more trouble than it's worth. I actually, on this tour, met some, on this book tour, met someone who has Parkinson's and is keeping it quiet. Um, with with very similar thinking, and but he had even though he hadn't read the he or she had not read this this essay, and but this person is extremely confident that no one knows. And then on my way out of this appointment, the uh, the person who's driving me around said. Did he tell you he has Parkinson's? And it turns out that everybody knows. So, I was wondering how your attitude towards the, the disease has changed over time. And have you felt pressure to become more of a public spokesperson? Well, yeah, I've resisted. Um, you don't want to become Mr. Parkinson's. And you know, I had a piece in the New Yorker a few a couple of weeks ago that really was not about Parkinson's, although it mentioned it. And everybody says, I really enjoyed your Parkinson's piece. So you know, th this is why I kept it secret as long as I could, because you know, it does start to define you. I wanted to actually read a, a couple of lines from that piece. Um, you wrote in The New Yorker, there are far worse medical conditions than Parkinson's, and there are far worse cases of Parkinson's than mine. But what I have at the level I have it is an interesting foretaste of our shared future, a beginner's guide to old age. And you sort of have this metaphor of life is a race to the finish line, and Parkinson's has, has given you a head start <laughs> in, in, in some ways. Um, and there, there seem to be two things going on here. One is, is that your symptoms actually resemble those of, of someone of a more advanced age. And also, you're perceived differently once people know that you have Parkinson's. And I, I think you, you said something like, when you let it be known that you had Parkinson's, you suddenly went from being 50 to being 60. Mm -hmm. um, 
Can you talk about the, the dynamic between those two things and, and how they contribute to, to how you feel about the disease? Well, um, you know, there are a lot of fancy French theories. Um, you may be familiar with them as a linguist about um, um, re the extent to which reality is a social construct and disease. Um, some you know people say or is in or Susan Sontag wrote that book about cancer. You know that that and I always thought that was sort of baloney, but it's really true. You know when I went public, most of I would say 60% maybe of, of what is irritating about having this disease is not, has nothing to do with the physical symptoms. It has to do with people knowing I have it. And so that is, even though I wrote a piece predicting it, it's been sort of a shock. So I wanted to, to shift gears a little bit and that's good. <laughs> talk about um, this this presidential campaign that we have going on this year. Um, you recently wrote a column for the Post that w was prompted by a, a number of comments from both Hillary and John McCain and Barack Obama that have been taken out of context. I, I think Obama's recent comments on Pennsylvanians clinging to, to guns and religion and um, McCain's comment about you know this hundred years war in Iraq come to mind, and I was curious to know what you think the the effect of the internet has been on making things like that more prominent. It's been terrible, but yeah, I mean, there's the internet is a plus, I think, not just for people who work in the industry, but it has some negatives, and one is this that, that um, it trivializes um, political campaigns because, uh, well, in part, this is going to sound extremely snooty, in part because there are, because it's been, because commentary has become democratized and people who, who are obsessed with these little things, you know, they blog and it filters up and it becomes an issue. And this campaign, I think, will be remembered as the campaign where umbrage was essentially what most of the discussion was. People are, all the candidates are looking for things to be offended by that the other one says. And then they get one and they wave it around and they say, this appalled me. I am disappointed in Senator Clinton or Senator Obama or Senator McCain. This is a terrible thing and it's ruined my, my life or at least, you know, my dinner. That, that, <laughs> that he or she should say such an awful thing. And generally, you know, they're actually delighted because it's given them an issue. And um, I wish people would just, you know, it's hard to say anything interesting in a context like that. Because when you say something interesting, you're taking a risk. And you may not get it quite right. And you're leaving an opening for someone to willfully misinterpret it. And I think Obama has been victimized by that quite a bit. You know, I don't, I don't let him completely off the hook. But, you know, he didn't say, well, well let's talk about Reverend Wright. Um, he, it wasn't that Obama had said any of this stuff. And Wright himself said it in a context which doesn't excuse it, but makes it more complicated. And I don't know if you, I haven't checked if YouTube has um, his speech, Wright's speech at the NAACP um, last week. I really urge people to listen to it because, I mean, there's some things that would make you cringe and there are some things that may be crazy, but there's a lot of interesting stuff in it, too. I mean, he talks about 
Um, mu I mean, he wanders off in a lot of directions. He talks about music and white people are all one, three, and black people are all two, four. And I don't know, I went through the kind of music I like and I decided I'm a two, four. So I dispute his theory and certainly the, um, um, you know, the idea that this would have any relevance to the presidential campaign. But it's interesting and, and you know, anyone with any sense will avoid being that interesting from now on, which is too bad. So do you see this as, as a trend that's going to continue making big deals out of these, these trivial aspects? Um, or do you think that we're going to reach some sort of a, a better balance in terms of the way politics are covered on the internet? Well, um, I think it's, it's probably going to get worse for a while, simply because you know, it, it, it took a little while for it to dawn on everybody that this would work. And now, and you know, for the rest of this campaign, certainly, everybody's going to be examining everything other candidates say, and the press are all ready to make an issue out of it. Um, how many people in small towns in Pennsylvania would have even thought to take offense at what Obama said if the press hadn't you know, said, this is outrageous. You people really should be offended. And uh, another factor, actually this ties back to some of the stuff I've written about Parkinson's, is people love an opportunity to be a victim. And in our political culture, that is essentially how you get what you want, is by claiming victimhood. So, you know, I have, a, my whole family comes from small town, Pennsylvania. So I can brag about that, you know, because for some reason that's now considered authentic, whereas any place else you might come <laughs> from isn't. But they're now, you know, they're told, hey, you can be a victim, you know, and so they say, sure, great. I am offended by what Obama said, you know, which it, it would never have occurred to them. Right. So just to, to take a step back, and speaking of Obama, you've, you've come out um, in support of him previously. Um, I was wondering how you think the, the Democratic nominating process is going to play out, and also the general election. You have said previously that you think John McCain is going to beat Obama in the general election, and, and you wrote a, a very funny piece about McCain's appeal. Um, there's one in the book and, and one that you wrote more recently by which, in which you basically said that, that the Republicans are playing this dirty trick on us by nominating a guy who people on the left, myself included, have a genuine respect for. Um, yeah, there was a couple of years ago, you know, McCain, I, I don't know why, but a lot of Republicans you know, hate him, and 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 so and so that caused a lot of Democrats to like him. And you know, a couple years ago, I don't know if you had this experience, but I had friends who said, "I I would vote for McCain over you know whatever Democrat they were criticizing, usually Hillary, or." Or they would, there were articles in the paper saying McCain might run as a third party or might run as a Democrat even. And, and so I think he's going to have a big advantage. In, in, you know, you can imagine people who, um, who, who are don't li Democrats who don't like the Democratic nominee, whoever that is, might well vote for McCain. I don't think there's a lot of Republicans who, if they don't like McCain, are going to vote for Hillary or Obama. Sure. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Slate 
and how you, you came to do this online magazine. Um, you're, keep in mind that, that you're at Google. Yeah, well. <laughs> and Slate was backed by Microsoft. Um, Google so did, is great to Slate. So I know that, that you had wanted to do a magazine for a long time, and at the time, you wanted to do an online magazine. How did Microsoft come into the picture? Well, um, I, I mean, I wanted to do an online magazine only because if you added the words online, to would you back me to start a magazine, your chance of getting a yes was, was greatly increased, even though no one really knew what that even meant, an online magazine in 95. I read in Newsweek, um, there was a piece about internet frenzy, and um, it said in there that Microsoft was looking to hire they said, a big name journalist to supervise their content uh, on the web. So I wrote to Steve, I emailed Steve Ballmer, who I knew slightly, and said, am I by any chance a big name journalist? <laughs> and he emailed me back that that Newsweek article was complete crap. But since I was in touch, um, <laughs> You know, come on out and we'll talk. And so I went. I went out to Microsoft, and 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 I was plunged into the interview loop, which I assume they have something similar here to hire you. And I didn't even realize that I was that this. We were talking about a job, um, but they offered me one, and and I said, what the heck. How do you think Slate changed after Microsoft sold it to, to the Washington Post company, if at all? Um, well, I shouldn't say this at Google, but one thing is technology became a lot easier. <laughs> um, it's, um, well, the reason, I mean, the reason, as I understand it, and maybe Googleies will think this is self-serving, is that at Microsoft, um, the really good developers weren't interested in Slate, was just not an interesting project for them. So we got developers who were interested in politics, which, <laughs> you know, which would be like having political journalists covering the White House who are really interested in technology. You know, it wasn't ideal, although they're, they're great people. Um, so so I, I think there's kind of the perception out there that after Slate moved over to, to the Post that it became a little less serious, a little more commercial. Do you think that's the, the trade-off that was made in this case, or a trade-off that needs to be made in, in any case when you're talking about online publications? Well, it um, gosh, I'd never heard that. I think the current editor, Jacob Weisberg, has, who has done a really good job of, of broadening the definition of what, what Slate covers especially in, in the realm of culture. And I worked for years at the New Republic, and I don't know if people here are familiar with it. It's got a sort of upper middle brow front of the book, which covers politics in a way which, when I ran it at least, and I think still, tries to be accessible to any intelligent person who's interested in politics, even if they're not totally up to speed. And then the back of the book was written for three academics in, <laughs> in, in Princeton or something. And it's still that way. And one of the things I wanted to do from the beginning was to define culture in a way that was accessible and also, you know, treated things like, you know, current movies or, or you know, even what's on television. And, um, and I didn't do that as, as well as I should have. And I think Jacob has taken that up and he does it much better. And yes, they've done, um, you know, a 
deals and they have a lot of stuff that is more commercial. But my purpose from the beginning was to make it self-supporting. And, you know, I guess I was like, I never got to lead it into that promised land, but Jacob did. It now makes money. And that is the best, the best assurance of, of, of political and intellectual freedom to write what you want is when you're not burdening anybody's cost structure. Um, so in, in the book, you write this really funny defense of online. And you chronicle all the evil uses that, that paper's been put to mm. over history. And at, at the same time, you also have a defense in, in the book of the New York Times in the wake of the, the Jason Blair mm. scandal. Um, and you, you make the argument that, well, in fact, the, the Times is actually the most plagiarized piece of work in American journalism. Um, how do you see the, the relationship between these traditional media outlets like The Times and online playing out? And do you still think that, that The Times and The Post have that same sort of influence um, that you wrote about in the book to, to set what's news? Um, well, uh, I wonder if anyone has calculated who makes more money off of the New York Times, the New York Times or Google. <laughs> and um, actually, a better example is the Los Angeles Times, where I worked. And I, I was down there the other day, first time I'd been back at the building since I'd been canned. And um, they are in um, clinical depression, all of them. And the circulation is down almost half. And I think, actually, that most newspapers, it's very gloomy. The one paper that will survive is the New York Times as a serious paper. I, it's sort of turning into a natural monopoly. So the, and there will be one. But you know, a, the Los Angeles Times was a good regional paper. Chicago Tribune, Miami Herald, Boston Globe. You don't need that anymore, you know, because you can get every, every English language newspaper is now competition for every other one. But I think the New York Times will do OK. Sure. Um, I wanted to, to ask you about something else in, in your journalistic history. And you, you write in the book um, about hypothetical questions and politicians' reluctance to answer them. And, and you come to the conclusion that politicians, if anyone, should be thinking about hypothetical questions all the time. If you're any sort of intelligent person, you should be thinking about these mm. all the time. And so I wanted to ask you a hypothetical uh, oh, question. Okay. Um, what if the, the, the great might have beens in recent American journalism is the possibility of your having gone to The New Yorker to become editor-in-chief. Um, Cy Newhouse offered you the job briefly yeah. before it went to David Remnick. Yeah. And I was wondering how you think a, a Michael Kinsley-edited New Yorker might have evolved well, over um, this decade. First of all, I've reluctantly concluded that he probably made the right choice in the end, because um, I think Remnick's done a very good job there. Um, but he has, um, he has continued their traditions. He hasn't broken much new ground. I Actually, I, what I would have liked most about being editor of The New Yorker is I never was editor of a publication where you could call up anybody and not be embarrassed and not have to beg them to write. You know, because the New Yorker is very prestigious and it pays a lot of money. And at the New Republic, we always lost money and paid practically nothing. And at Slate, most time I was there, people didn't even know what the internet was. So you had to beg and plead. So I think given that situation, he's used it very well. I think, um, you know, I don't know, it would have been, that's a hypothetical question. <laughs> Um, I, I think it would have been a little bit um, 
jazzier, a little bit more looking for trouble, and um, probably finding it. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that, that you did when you were at the LA Times was essentially to in, invite everyone and anyone to rewrite the, the editorials at the paper. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that experiment and if, if you were to do it again, how you might approach it differently. Well, this was, this was just, I took wiki, you know, the wiki um, technology and just stuck. It was, it was a very casual thing and it's, I'm a little alarmed that it's my legacy there. Um, we put up an editorial about the war in Iraq, which was very anti-war. And then we said anyone who wants to can come in and play with it. You know, it wasn't even in the, it was in, in the wiki um, format. It didn't even look like the LA Times. But, and for a couple of days, it was really interesting. And um, a lot of people, you know, fiddled with it and made interesting points. There was an obvious flaw in our reasoning, which is that you can't, there's no way two people who totally disagree about an issue can really jointly produce an editorial about it. It's not like the Wikipedia, where everybody, in theory at least, is trying to do the same thing. Jimmy Wales, who you know, founded the Wikipedia, who I hadn't even met at that point, went in and totally on his own initiative broke, the, broke it into two, one pro and one anti, which was a great idea that hadn't occurred to us and then people played with it. And this went on for about three days. And then um, um, uh, basically uh, people, people went in and, and replaced it all with disgusting child pornography. And, and we had to pull the whole thing down. In fact, this stuff was so bad that our newsroom lawyer, who I had had many arguments with, who, uh, she was an absolute First Amendment absolutist, you know, you should go to jail forever to protect your sources. Newspapers have every right to violate national security, anything. And she said, she came in Monday morning, this had happened over the weekend, she said, I've changed my mind about the First <laughs> Amendment. <laughs> it was that bad. Um, well, there's lots of things you can do. You can, um, you can restrict entry um, it, somehow. Um, that I mean, I guess every solution basically requires some form of of limited entry, only letting in people you trust. Do you have any other similar experiments that, that you'd like to try out if you were to go back to online? Oh journalism? God, I have a whole list. You know, um, I was about two years ago. I was about to spend the semester up at um, the press, um, whatever it is, at Harvard. You know, and um, I, I I had this idea. This shows how, how, how out of it I am. I said I wanted to get six really bright young journalists and six really bright young tech, tech, technical people and then uh, get them to pair up and produce some kind of new form of journalism using the technology. And I, and I have, I can't think of it right now, but I've got a list. Um, probably it's all been done since it's been two years. But uh, they said, what are you talking about? We'll get you 12 people who are both. And then, um, I don't know, there was my career. I went and took a job at The Guardian instead. And, and so I never actually did that. But uh, I own the URL um, uh, Beta Paper and the URL News Kitchen. And someday I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use them for something like that. Because I, I do think there are, there are there are things that even Google hasn't done that could use the technology in, in, in useful ways. Great. Well, we're looking forward to it. Um, with that, I wanted to open it up to, to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, if you could make your way over to the microphone on the left, that would be great. Oh, nobody's. Take your time. <laughs> Time's up. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have outrage fatigue. Um, yeah, just, me too. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I wonder if it's if it's a genuine strategy 
of certain administrations to commit outrages so fast that, that the wheels of justice and oversight can't keep up. Uh, oh, I think you mean something slightly different. You mean genuine outrages that you're tired of. I thought you meant people getting outraged. What I was talking about, oh, the no, phony no. umbrage. You, no, mean, you mean George Bush is doing so awful things at too fast a rate for your outrage to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I think that, that he's not smart enough to figure that out. <laughs> Let me say oh, this Rogue though: is. there is um, there is one uh, sort of sort of related irony, which is the more mad people get at George Bush, it ought to be hurting McCain. But in fact, I think as people get more and more tired of George Bush, it hurts Hillary instead because they think enough with relatives, oh. you know, <laughs> and and and, sh and she. She is more hurt by the deplorable um, Bush administration than McCain is. And I don't know what you do about that. It's unfair. Right. In some ways, this is a related question. Uh, some things that I am tremendously, tremendously outraged about, such as the recent revelations that the highest levels of the Bush administration sat around in an office and discussed exactly what level of torture was appropriate. Um, seems to be six page news at best. And the media just doesn't seem interested. And I'm very confused about, you know, I, I've never believed this business about the liberal media or the conservative media or anything else. But I'm very confused about what's driving them to follow certain stories and ignore certain stories. Doesn't mesh in my mind. Do you have any comments on that? Well, I, I think you're right that it's related. I think there is outrage fatigue. Or I don't know, I think the fact that they discussed what level of torture indicates that at least they were thinking there might be some limit. So, <laughs> so, so that, 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 that's a plus. There is, a, one of the things I love about reading the papers, there's a huge random element in what becomes news and what doesn't. You know, it can have to do with if there was something similar that happened recently, you know, that we've already done that. Um, it can be, my first job, I was working for Ralph Nader back when he was sane, and he, I did a report about, um, oh, it had to do with the, country clubs getting property tax breaks, and even though they were def on the grounds they were preserving green space, and, uh, and, and even though they discriminated, of course. And um, I turned into this report at the end of the summer, and I never heard, and I sort of went back to school and forgot about it. He released it on the day after Christmas, because he knew that that was a day when it would get, you know, front page news, because um, there was nothing else. And, and there, there's a lot of things like that that may, you can't really predict how, how the press is going to treat, treat something. But, um, you know, why that was on page six, I wouldn't get too conspiratorial. It probably is just an accident. So I have a question I asked Strobe Talbot. I'm thinking I should ask every political or journalistic guest that comes here the same question until they get wise to it. Um, the question is, it's often said that the US won the Cold War. Would you agree or disagree with that? And if so, why? Um, oh, I think the US won the Cold War. We may be losing the next one. Um, but what's your argument that it didn't? Oh, I don't want to bias it. <laughs> I'm just, um, I can tell you what Talbot said. I'm sort of annoyed with myself I didn't ask Clinton and Obama and McCain when they were here, but considering how Obama was all ready for Eric Schmidt's question about how would you sort a million 32-bit integers in one kilobyte of memory, by the way, how would you? Um. <laughs> I leave that to you. That's, that's, that's the division of labor in, in a capitalist system. But I mean, are you saying that the, 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 the Cold War, um, because it turned out not we, the, being a unipolar world, as they said, didn't turn out to be as wonderful as we expected. Is that your 
Well, I think there's a lot of takes on this question. And I was thinking it could be sort of a litmus test for how people respond to it, because there's no obvious ideological slant. I do think that, the, the, that it's completely ridiculous to give Reagan credit for ending the Cold War. That's one thing I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think it was, um, well, not, Reagan never said he was trying to, the, the, the way I look at it is, under what circumstances would the people who say Reagan won the Cold War be prepared to say that Reagan's defense buildup was a mistake? If the exact opposite had happened, if the Soviets were stronger and stronger, they would say, see, that vindicates the buildup. And then when instead the Soviet Union collapsed, something they never predicted, in fact, Reagan specifically said he didn't want, he wanted to reach out in peace and live together, blah, blah, blah. And then they said, well, that proves that, um, proves that, the, um, that, the, that, that Reagan won the Cold War. And there's some, there's some lot, there's some, um, principle of logic that says if, it, if, if a statement is, if there's no circumstances under which a statement is untrue, then it's meaningless. And there's no circumstances under which the statement, Reagan won the Cold War, is untrue in the, in the, in the view of Republicans and conservatives. Therefore, it, it's meaningless. That's my argument. Just for completeness, Mr. Talbot said it was kind of a politician's answer. He said, well, a lot of people won the Cold War, the liberals in Russia and Europeans, and he kind of yeah. spread the credit around so it didn't have to give too much to Reagan. <laughs> um, I agree with that, but I don't think Reagan deserves any more credit than any of the other uh, U.S. presidents, um, some of whom were Democrats. Hi, thanks so much for coming. Oh, yeah. uh, can you talk uh, about when you were compiling the book, how you chose what essays to put in there, and also if you have any favorites? Um, gosh, that's a tough question. <laughs> Thanks. Um, actually, I hired an intern and told him to pick them. <laughs> um, the, 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 the real question I faced was I was really tempted to only, I got, I sort of, um, uh, you know, I write some very serious things, and then I write some very jokey type pieces. And um, they don't really mix all that well. And I think, you know, the, the people, uh, I, the jokey ones I don't get credit for because people think I'm serious, and the serious ones I don't get credit for because they think I'm just a jokester. So I thought for a while I would only run the funny ones because books full of humor tend to sell more. And, but then my vanity got the better of me. <laughs> and so there is a mix, a mix of them. But that was, that was the tough question. And I think I, I did err on the side of putting in the, the, the funnier ones. As a result of which, Publishers Weekly, in a generally favorable view, said, Kinsley does not allow himself to be sidetracked by serious arguments. <laughs> <laughs> or something like, or he doesn't bother to plumb the depths, he just, or something which sounded like a compliment until you thought about it. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to ask you a, a follow-up to that. You seem to have the, these two approaches um, to your subjects in the book. How do you decide which one to take? You mean when funny making your or argument? serious? Yes. Well, um, if I can think of a funny angle, I think I always go with that generally, because the people because that's rarer. You know, I don't think there. I mean, there's Dave Barry and who else? Who who is, um, you know, really funny, right? Oh, Joel Lockenback at the Post. But in general, the humor column, there there isn't much. Actually, that's a field which has really been sort of taken over, I guess, by the internet and the uh, TV. You know, John Stewart and so forth. But, yes, sir. Um, the other day I was visiting the New York Times website and there was a big color display ad for Grand Theft Auto 4. Does that seem wrong to you? Because, of, because it's violent and bad for children? Um, something like that, yeah. Yeah. I'm amazed at actually the, all the companies that make vi vi video games, that, there, that that isn't a bigger issue the violence in video games. When you think of the fuss that some politicians can stir up over, over um, you know, other things. You know, where's Joe Lieberman when you need him? 
Um, I've even, I've never had the guts to ask Bill Gates why Microsoft produces some of these really disgusting, violent things. I have asked my wife, who, uh, who was very high up at Microsoft, um, and she says, it's business. So there's your answer. Right. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, so Slate started off as a free magazine, then went to a for-pay magazine, and then went back to free, and then you know, Salon went from free to for-pay, and then New York Times has gone from for-pay to free. So I w wondered if you could discuss you know, how, it, how it affects a, a magazine being free versus being um, paid content. Well, it was a disaster. The year we, were, we, were, uh, we charged 1995 for one year. And this was totally my mistake, probably my biggest mistake. I really thought when I started this, well, you know, if you're going to knock yourself out to produce something like a, a serious magazine, you want to think that you know, people, people say, oh, it's so great, I read it, I love it, but I'm not going to pay 20 bucks for it. You know, that you, you're tempted to say, well, screw you, I'm not going to do it then. But, you know, as we all know, it turned out that the ad model is just makes much more sense. We were sort of the first ones um, to, to, or among the first, to try charging. And then our position after that was, we hope someone tries it, we'll go second. <laughs> you know, we thought we'd paid our dues. And now I think it's very clear. Even the Wall Street Journal, I believe, is dropping the wall. And they were the one great example of a newspaper that was getting away with charging. So, I, you know, it's pe people, and people would say, I remember this guy called up from Nightline once. He was doing something about the internet. And he says, well, how can you ever make money if you don't charge, if you don't charge people to see it? And I said, how many people <laughs> paid to watch Nightline last night? <laughs> you know, so actually, the idea of free content is not new to the internet. Television, until you know HBO and things, is, is even today is mostly free content. Newspapers, you pay for the paper, not the content. The, va the value of the newsprint is more than more than you know. You have to pay to subscribe. Magazines, many of them, what you pay doesn't even cover the cost of finding you. You know the solicitation. So nobody's paying for, you know, nobody's, all content is, content only wants to be free, but it is free. And it's the same on the internet. Salon really got my goat because they, when we charged, they ridiculed us and said we didn't understand the internet and so on and so forth. And then, so we, we, and that was true, actually. Uh, but so we stopped charging. And then suddenly, several years later, when they got financially desperate, they started charging. And I don't even know what they're up to now. Does anyone ever read Salon? Yes. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's free, but you can be a premium subscriber and skip a lot of the ads. So. Oh. Well, you know, that, that's, that's an interesting choice. Hope it doesn't work. <laughs> Actually, I, I, don't care. I don't care. Where, where is this? this is YouTube? I don't care about so long. <laughs> hey, thank you. We have time for one more question. Um, hi, thanks for coming. I'm actually one of the people who paid that year uh, for uh, Slate. Do, do, you have, uh, do you have your umbrella? And I was going to thank you for the umbrella. Um, uh, well, you can have a few more if you'd like. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I really enjoy reading um, uh, all the material you write, and, and so there was part of me that was happy when you switched over to become a, a writer uh, full time. Oh, thank you. Um, and in order to, so I don't miss anything, I have one of these search alerts that searches for your name, and I've noticed that recently your name comes up very often for the, uh, the Kinsley gaffe, um, oh, that everybody yes. quotes this. And I just wondered if you uh, have thoughts about that, that aspect of your immortality of having, having coined well, that. That, that, is, um, that is my Google. Um, that's what you get. You get about 20 of those before you get anything else if you search for me on Google. Um, you know, it just gets more and more true since I first said it. A gaffe is when a politician tells the truth. 
That, that's the point. <laughs> Although, you know, I slightly regret it because as I, this umbrage problem is sort of the opposite, which is that people, people, you know, someone will say something somewhat stupid but relatively harmless, like Obama about, you know, small towns in Pennsylvania. And everyone says, this is a Kinsley gaffe when a politician not tells the truth but tells what's really on his mind. And, you know, I, I sort of think, gosh, I, it's sort of ridiculous that, 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 that he clearly doesn't mean that, but we're claiming that, that his subconscious has welled up when he wasn't expecting it. And, um, you know, if I, and, and that, then the, but the, the, the quote about a Kinsley gaffe sort of lends that notion. I sort of wish I hadn't said it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, Michael Kinsley, thank you so much for joining thank us today. Thank you. This is great.